here I am. Well, I hope I hope it's being recorded. Yes. Yes. Well, two exciting things to talk about today. This is exciting. Yeah, well, first of all, we're early and I really like that. You do? I uh yeah. I like that idea too. I think this is a uh this is a good thing. Eleven o'clock feels right. Yeah, I was thinking that twelve thirty to one thirty kind of um, it divides the day in uh, it really in does an unnatural, uh, unnatural way. It, uh, it, yeah, before twelve thirty feels unnatural, and after one thirty feels unnatural. But before eleven feels just right, and after twelve feels just right. So I, I think I was you're just right. Adjusting, I was just adjusting to um, psychological factors here. Which yeah. is very important, yeah, Matt, because you know what's funny is besides, like, because aside from psychological factors, there aren't any other factors. Maybe we only have to go five minutes today. <laughs> we just wrapped oh, that it might up. Be it. <laughs> You know, uh, Joe Polish and I, when we first started doing um, I Love Marketing, we would do it at uh, on Sunday evenings. We would do it, you know, at 8 p.m. on Sunday after. And for years, I did uh, my Marketing Monday um, podcast. I would record on Saturday or Sunday evening immediately after 60 minutes. And so I was anchoring it to something that was in my normal routine right so i would do i would watch 60 minutes and during 60 minutes and the commercials or whatever i'm kind of you know getting my thoughts together on what i was going to um talk about on marketing monday this was a solo podcast and i would do maybe you know 8 to 12 or 15 minutes um just just by myself on uh, and release it every Monday morning. And I would watch 60 minutes, get my thoughts together of the thing. And as soon as Andy Rooney was, uh, was done, I would go in and turn on the computer, record the, um, the audio and do the whole, um, the whole thing. This was before I really had the, dial talk done methodology i would do the whole thing i would do the the uh process i would record and then i would you know edit the audio and put the theme song on and then upload it to the cloud and put it on the um you know send it up to to itunes so you know it might take 45 minutes total to do that uh, whole thing but that was the routine and it was anchored to something that that's already happening so it really felt effortless and uh, natural you know but i think that that's this our our podcast the way the rhythm of it the way that we do it it's just becomes part of my natural rhythm yeah. like sunday is is a day that i use as like a a, a buffer day um you know with some mm -hmm. focus activity kind of um things but I like that. Um, I love that rhythm. And, and it's just, I think 11 o'clock even feels more natural. It know? just fits. Right. It just fits. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, when you're, you're talking about uh, the early days of doing podcasts, it's like when Wilbur still needed Orville to kind of be there and give a real push to the propeller to get the whole airplane thing going, you know. Uh -huh. We all have our early days. We all have our early days when that's right. You know, we started in on some new grand adventure, but um it wasn't as easy. You know, we had to do all sorts of steps like the right part. This by the by the way, you know, neither um and this this is a cautionary note that I'm going to give you right here that neither Wilbur or Orville Wright, before their first plane fight, uh, were licensed. They had no pilot's license oh to do what they goodness. did. Oh, my goodness. They had no license to do it? They had no license. They had no license to do what they were doing. And there you go. 
Oh, that's so funny. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and there were lots of things. You know, Gutenberg was not a licensed printer. Um, you know, uh, not at all. I mean, not at all. There was no diploma. I, how how did anyone know that what they were going to get from Gutenberg was going to be top notch, top notch um, printing? That's that's what I want to know. I mean, yes. How? <laughs> it's, it's just, there's no standards. Yeah. Who's monitoring all of this? Mm-hmm. Did I ever tell you though? This is a you know an apocryphal story. Do you know what an apocryphal story is? I'm about to add apocryphal to my like I've heard the word. I've well, an apocryphal the story is that can't be proven to be true, but oh, okay. it's a really good but it's a really good story that proves the point. So that's what an apocryphal okay. story is. It's okay. it's uh, there there there's no way to check if it was actually true, but um, it proves the point. So anyway, one of the stories is that. Uh, one of the first big customers that Gutenberg had. So Gutenberg's around 1455, as near as we can figure, um, you know, when he started using movable type, uh, didn't, didn't create printing because printing had been around for quite a long time. But what he did was instead of the plates being individually carved out, what he said is, let's just have the, you know, the letters as separate um, you know, separate modules, and then we can just create a plate with a frame, and we'll have lots of A's, lots of B's, lots of C's, and we'll instead of having to carve a one-off, one-only plate, you we just right uh, re- redo that. You know, very uh, and uh, seems really simple right now, but uh, totally revolutionary at the time. But one of his first um, first customers supposedly was a bishop a local religious leader in his area of Germany. And uh, this bishop ordered a hundred books and these were essays. These were um, sermons or deep thoughts that the bishop had had. And apparently he was a quite famous, quite famous, um, um, uh, you know, gave famous lectures and he wanted the benefit of printing to spread the word about his thoughts so anyway, uh, and Gutenberg, feeling that this would be a great advantage, gave him a real deal. So he didn't charge the bishop very much. Didn't wasn't the going price, um, but gave him a special deal, expecting that you know the the bishop's use of printing and widespread, you know, spreading it wide and far with this new technique would uh, bring a lot of business. And we all do that, you and I. All mm-hmm. entrepreneurs do that, and um, um, and so uh, Gutenberg, you know, it's out there. He prints it, he delivers it, and it's uh, you know, it's a couple of weeks, and he doesn't hear anything. But and then it's a month, and he doesn't hear anything. And it's now in ninety days, and he doesn't hear anything. There's nothing back. There's no evidence that the bishop has sent you know, the book's out. And uh, so he starts making polite inquiries with the staff, the servants of the bishop. And he says, has the bishop, um, you know, has he started to send these books? He said, I delivered a hundred. I wonder if he, you've been seeing packages with, you know, these books going out to um, people that the bishop knows. And um, one of the servants goes and checks and comes back. And he said, no, he's not. uh, He's only, He's only proofread 85 of them so far, so until he gets to 100. (laughs) He's only proofread 85 of them. Oh, that's great. That's funny. But it's uh, proof that's not true. Yeah, but you know, I mean, we laugh at it, but but in that that's in response to a new technology in the 15th century. But we have new technologies today, where yes. we're trying to understand them. Um, you know, we're trying to understand them with a previous understanding of how things work. But things work differently. Uh, well, differently I'm about now, to. And, uh, uh, I'm about to experience that with my new Tesla that I've ordered now, which should arrive this week, perhaps. This was a three? No, I've got the one, um, the X 
like um, oh the same as we do. Right? We have the X. Yeah, we have uh -huh. the X. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which has pluses and minus. Can I tell you the pluses? I would love to hear. It's got an incredible amount of storage room because uh -huh. there's no engine. There's no yeah. engine. You're sitting on the battery, so there's no drive shaft down the middle of the car. Yeah. So, um, and where the engine would be in a normal North American car, there's a front trunk, so you can pack oh. things in there. And then there, because there's no drive shaft in the back, because um, um, it doesn't really look like an SUV, but it, we had no. a uh, we had a BMW uh, X5 before, which you we did. loved. I I personally loved it, and it had a lot of room, mm -hmm. and uh, and and the X has more room. It's got, I would say it's got 20% more package room, and mm -hmm. so in the back where you would normally in an SUV have a lot of packing room underneath that there's another um, storage area so you can get where a lot the gas below tank that would be yeah yeah where the gas where the gas tank would be yeah so that's the plus and um, the plus number two is Babs loves it um, mm -hmm. she's the driver of the Tesla I'm not the driver she loves mm -hmm. it she loves the handling she loves the maneuverability she loves the speed of response she loves everything uh, mm -hmm. there's two things i don't like about it uh, okay uh, i'll say i'll say this far and wide you know i mean i'm a i'm a courageous consumer i'll i'll give yes yeah. i'll give i'll, I'll give really powerful you. feedback i'll give really powerful feedback where it's deserved uh it's taking one of my hero roles away from me a lifetime with babs 37 year hero role actually 35 years because she We've had it for two years, and that is Babs has um, low ability to deal with toxicity, especially fumes. So okay. she always had a rough time going into the gas station and gassing up. Uh, I, you were that I, on the other hand, I, on the other hand, am a, a, a connoisseur, connoisseur of uh, gas fumes since age five or six. So I, uh -huh. I really appreciate the different yes. elegance of the... the you know the, the enormous different variations there are in gas fumes, and if I could yeah. bag it up and take it home for later, I would do it. So I was the person who got to be the hero, but uh, you know that's been taken away from me. That uh, that role has been taken away from me. Is there any consolation in perhaps getting to be the man who plugs in the circuit? No, no. No, no, no. It's not the hands off. It's open hands free. off. You know. Yep. Yeah. I'm. I do. By the way, I learned that there is no smell to gas. It's an added scent to gasoline. Uh, in order to be able to detect fumes, so wow. uh, gasoline actually has no smell. And so, so I'm going is. through back. I'm going through back channels to see if I can just get the smell of gas as a separate uh -huh. spray bottle or something and just have Perfect. it in my toilet kit. And in the morning, Maybe I can the, just go. In one of the glove compartments of your Tesla. No, or I could just, uh, in the morning, just spray it on the back oh. of my hand or something okay. like that. Yeah. I could just have that that gas smell and, you know, it. It, would, uh, it'd be a, it would be a sort of a, a nostalgic scent, yes. uh, you know. But the one that uh, gets me, I don't like the doors. I don't like the uh, passenger doors. The gull doors. wing. No. The gull wings. It takes forever. You know, you have a package in the old days. Yeah. You just open the back door and you popped it in. Now Slide it in, uh, close the door. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now it's uh, it's a production. And the other thing is that it um, uh, is very sensitive uh, about what's on either side. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you get halfway, it'll come halfway. Sometimes you won't, it's detecting things. But uh, all in all, all in all, uh, you know, if Babs loves it, everything's good. Yes. Yeah, I wonder about that. Like, that's going to be an interesting thing because I have a routine of, you know, walking into the garage and then I open the rear door, put my, my, uh, my bag in the back seat and then close it and then get in and drive away. And I, that's one thing I've been imagining is how's that going to change? Yeah, I think you'll, not you'll so think about easy it. To just, yeah. 
here's the thing. I think you're going to think about it every time you do it. And yeah. um, Elon's going to come up negative on that particular yeah. checkoff point. The other, the other thing is that uh, we've noticed that we've had trouble with the back trunk, you know, the, at the very uh, closing. And uh, sometimes it closes and sometimes it rejects your attempt to close it, uh, you know, when you press okay. the button. And we've talked to the uh, local um, Tesla service people here, uh, yeah. and we discovered there is none. There actually isn't any a local oh. Tesla service here in Ontario. Okay. And uh, so we're three months now, and I was looking at, I know Elon wants to attach his brain to the internet, but I I want to just slip a note into his office that before he touches his brain to the uh, to the internet, whether he could actually get our back trunk door fixed. Oh boy! Well, I will see. I, I mean, I'll have a full report. I don't know if you report. have any. I don't know if you have any pull or anything there. You know, Not certainly, at all. But you certainly know, before he um, goes to certainly before he goes to Mars. I mean, that that trunk has yes, to be finished. We don't want that's, that. That's got to yeah. be finished. Well, Nick uh, Nick Nansen got his last week, and he's oh. got he's got all black, and I've got all white. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see the uh, them side by side, the ebony Nick, and ivory Nick, of it all. Nick and Nick and I have you outnumbered. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go black. Uh huh. Go black. Well, yours is white, but you're half and half. You're, you're I mean, but. Yeah, yeah, our our Tesla. Um, we always we always buy black cars. We like black cars. They okay. For some reason, black cars don't seem to age as fast as other cars. I don't know why okay. it is. I never yeah, keep, keep them long them, enough. I, mean, I never keep them yeah. long enough for them to age. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you. Well, that'll I be an interesting lo- thing, I though, to move. I th- yeah, I think you'll love the response. You know, I yeah. think you'll love the, um, you know, how fast it responds. There's yeah. much to be um, said about it. Uh, but in rush hour here in Toronto, we get to um, 15 miles per hour faster than a lot of cars do. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, the, what I'm really looking As the forward Tesla, to. I don't know if you know. I, I don't know if they told you this at the dealership, but in rush hour, the Tesla actually isn't any faster than any other car. No, exactly. The um, the thing that I'm most excited about, though, is the fully autonomous uh, mode, which is Florida has allowed it. And before the end of the year, it'll be switched on here in Florida where I can just type in where I'm going and it'll fully navigate without any uh, intervention and that's going to be an exciting uh you know shift so i'm, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. really i'm kind of excited about but that. you will but you i don't know about florida law but you will be required to be in the driver's seat with your oh yeah um, hands immediately available if anything goes wrong yeah you're but this autonomous mode you don't have to keep your hands on the wheel and you don't have to touch it every, um, you know, Mm. I think there's, this is one level above that. What they have right now, the autopilot, you still have to touch it every couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But this mode is, you don't have to do that, but it's, um, it will be interesting. No, I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing about this, uh, is again, you know, my comment at the beginning of our podcast today, Dean, is that everything's psychological. So it's not yes. uh, technologically um, some real breakthroughs. Uh, what he's talking about there, but the what is the psychology that supports whether this goes forward or doesn't go forward? And I just suggest to you that there's one psychological barrier that um, might take some time to overcome that um, under most in the insurance laws in Ontario, so I'm speaking about Canada here, 
Uh, it doesn't matter if the car is operating itself. You, as the driver, are 100% responsible. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you, they're, they're asking you to give up control, but you still have 100% responsibility, and that's not mm-hmm. a technological issue. That's a psychological issue. Right. Well, it's a... It's a it's a legal issue too. <laughs> yeah, right. Legal. But I often liability. think, Dan, too, like you know, you, you talk about, um, you know, everybody's excited about this autonomous um, driving and stuff. But you know, you've been, you've had the benefit of autonomous driving for over twenty, as long as I've known you. Twenty years. That, yes. Yeah, in that your driver picks you up and takes you exactly where you're going with no hands on the wheel, no anything you've been experiencing yep. autonomous driving for mm-hmm. uh for since uh years. since 2000 since 2000 yeah it'll be 20 years next year so i haven't yeah. driven in the city of toronto now babs is periodically when we're on the open road you know we're on yeah super highway has relinquished um you know the driver role and i've you know been able to yeah. um go for an hour or two and um everything like that. But inside the city of Toronto, um, I just really don't, you know, it's not an experience that I have. Yeah. Um, it's not that I hate it. It's just that I never loved it. You know, it's, it right. wasn't that, uh, it's just that if I could be relieved of, of actually everything related to the driving, the parking, the maintenance, you know, maintaining and everything, I had never really become attached to it in the first place, so it was an easy thing just to relinquish. I remember my first uh, experience of seeing that happen was you and I had um, lunch at Marche um, several Mm -hmm. years ago. And I remember we had lunch, and then we, we were in there for a couple of hours, and then we came out and literally, you know, we walked out the door, and there was your car right there waiting at the curb for you and i thought mm-hmm. you know that's mm-hmm. the coolest uh that's the coolest mm-hmm. thing because you had arranged mm-hmm. already that i'm gonna be you know at one o'clock let's get this uh, uh beat me up right here at this door so you walk mm-hmm. right out the door straight into the car and off you go yeah and the driver i mean the company is the same and uh you know it's uh it's become even more useful over the years because they're part of a worldwide network of, um, you know, reputable limousine companies. So yeah. if we're, if we're going, for example, uh, we were in Eric, Texas, we were in Dallas and Phoenix a week ago. Um, and, uh, all we have to do is our secretary phones, our local, you know, our local, um, uh, Bennington is the name of yeah. our, uh, it's a Toronto-based company, but they're connected to this network in 600 cities, actually. It's 600 cities mm-hmm. around the world. And all we have to do is say we would like a pickup at this airport at the other end, going to this hotel at the other end. And that's all taken as if we're making a local call. Local, yeah. In other words, so so it's all the same service. Everything is billed back to us and, uh, yeah. you know, in the same thing. So. Um, and I will say, however, that in all those other cities, the service that we have in Toronto is actually better than a, any of the other companies. And, um, I meant to ask, a very, very Dan, if you, uh, if you got to experience the, the Black Lane. Um, no, I haven't done it yet. And, okay. uh, and here's another psychological stepping. We're so loyal to our, you know, to our Bennington company that, uh-huh. uh, we would say it would be like having an affair, you know, we would be, and Babs and I would be actually be doing something on the slide because, you know, with Black Lane, we have to um, use another service. And uh, No, no, uh, you mean it's a limo that, service? No, you don't. It's a limo you, service, yeah. No, 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 no. So the airport service. We can use service, Bennington. The airport service ba- is separate from the uh, limo service, yes. So you can use oh. Bennington. And they drop you off at, you know, post 37. And then that's where Black Lane will meet you there at that post. And they'll have your boarding pass and they'll walk you through um, everything and take you right to the plane. 
It's a done deal. As of, yes. uh, as of the end of this phone call, it's a done deal. See, I thought I was cheating. No, I no, no, I, no. You don't. I thought it was no, required no, you, that I cheat on my limousine service. And they coordinate with Bennington. You just tell them who you're using, and they will um, coordinate with your Bennington driver and say, "Okay, we're arriving here." You know, that's the. Uh, now, do they do it coming back? Yep, they'll meet you at the. Uh, they meet you at the jetway, like when you walk off of your plane. Oh. They meet you there, Dean, and I'm, Dean, I'm so excited. Yes, I'm telling you, Dan, because I, I was. Uh, you're you had excited me about the possibility, and explained. Uh, you know, some of our listeners are not picking up on this because they may. Well, I forgot we're it. we're actually uh, recording a podcast. The um, yeah, so I was excited and told you about my um, my experience that I found at the Toronto airport. That one of the things that's so unpredictable and undesirable about travel to me is I was breaking it down. I don't mind I don't mind taking the limo to the airport. That's no problem. I don't mind actually like being on the plane and, and traveling all of the frustration and, and friction in travel is from the curb to the gate. That period of Mm -hmm. time is fraught with, you know, with in, uh, you know, surprises and, and, uh, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Right. Especially when, you go to when you're flying out of Toronto because on some days the um, you know some days the security and customs even if you have priority and and are um, flying business class or first class it's still there's a lot of of um, unpredictability in that and and a lot of waiting and I found this service. Um, called Black Lane that is available in you know 300 airports where they will meet you at the curb. So uh, my, my experience of it was in, in Toronto the first time. They uh, met me at the curb, had my boarding pass already printed out, and I was. Uh, they took my bag and uh, they took me right to the head of the security line. I got to go, uh, you know, right through security. Um, didn't, you know, didn't get to skip security, but I had to, um, you know, still put my bag through the, um, yes. the X-ray and all that stuff. Then right to the front of the customs line, mm-hmm. and uh, then into the Air Canada lounge, where I, I sat there. I watched Wimbledon um, for about an hour. Uh, they came back when it was time to go to the gate, took my bag, walked me right to the gate, straight onto the plane, put my bag in the overhead compartment, shook my hand, and off we went. And it was the yeah, most what? relaxing, friction-free experience. It made it like uh, it was delightful. Yeah. Now, check bags, how does that get handled? Same thing. If I had checked bags, they would take my bag and and check them in. Um, but give you the, your, uh, uh, and then yeah, they, would they would give you your, make sure that you got your, yeah, your, my baggage claim yeah. stuff. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, my life is changing today. As of yes, this I'm phone call you. for the rest, uh, from this, the end of this. Um, podcast today for the rest of my life. Um, I'm a black lane guy. I I just saw you had thrown me into a bit of a moral quandary. No. Uh, with <laughs> my, my, my. But, but here's the thing. You can see how, you know, um, things like psychological and moral are actually a part. A I part get it. Of, Especially when you've got such a long standing record where <laughs> You know, you're you're a very um, you have a lot of equity in that relationship. Yeah, well, not only that, with this particular company, I'm number one, so they yeah. have uh, on the uh, you know they have their little iPod when I get into the car, and it's got um, Mr. Dan Sullivan, and it's got five stars, 
And I said, what's, um, what's um, five stars? And he said, well, Mr. Sullivan, you are in the top 10 of our customers. And he said, if you don't mind me saying so, you're actually number one. You use Bennington more than any other individual. And believe me, wow. we appreciate it. So you can see the the, the moral and psychological get it. quandary. Yeah, but I'm just happy you, when, when you, you go down to Black me. Lane. Yeah, when you go to Black Lane, you look, there's a tab for airport services. That's what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny because I get off at uh, post 35 right now for, you know, we have, um, we call, we have a red cap, you know, uh-huh. and and they used to be able to do a lot more, but then they changed the whole arrangement of checking in, uh-huh. you know, I mean, after 9-11, everything got yeah. re uh, redone and they used to be able to take me right through to, you know, yeah. all the bags and uh, they would take me through security and customs one person but then they cut them off they um you know it's like switching over from gasoline to electric i mean their role Mm -hmm. was taken away from them so we've been sort of in no man's land ever since then but this is a total solution this is a better solution than we ever had before yes so i'm excited for you oh oh right i am so relieved when is your next trip well, it'll be, um, I can tell you exactly, it'll be, it'll be the 7th of September to Chicago. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and that's yeah great. I'm off. Uh, I'm off I was the actually cottage. contemplating, uh, I was actually contemplating coming up to Chicago for the, uh, the, the other game changer uh, group. Oh, you were encouraging us. They'd to love do you. That. They'd love you. They'd love having you. Yeah. And I think that's uh, September at the, 12th. Dinner at, it, it kicks off with dinner at the house. Yes. So that's the night before the game changers. So for the next two quarters still, we have the game changer on the Thursday. And then the 10 times is on the Friday, but we're switching that next year because I think uh, having the 10 times the day before is superior. Yes. And so we will be having the um, um, party. We'll have a party the night before. that will be a Wednesday night before the uh, mm-hmm. before the, um, the game changer. And uh, <laughs> but it's a great group. Great group, about you know, fifteen or so, and uh, yeah. they you're you're famous. Uh, you know, you'll you'll walk in with high credibility. Oh, this is good. Well, yeah, and okay. you know what it'll be like? It'll be like the size of one of your um, breakthrough blueprints. My breakthrough blueprints, yeah. And, and actually, you'll you, probably what I know of breakthrough book uh, blueprint. Uh, you'll find the atmosphere and how things get talked about very similar you know or certainly resonant i don't know about similar but That's very great. resonant and a lot of my a lot of my r&d for the or the bigger group actually happens first in the smaller groups so it's more oh, experimental well, more innovative yeah now can exciting. i tell you about my dream can i tell you about That's my I dream would, i want to hear about your dream and i also <laughs> want to talk about leonardo uh Da Vinci. So. Da Vinci. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about your dream. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I, I have to tell you, my entire lifetime, and I dream a lot. So I'm a I'm a dreamer. You know, I'm very, uh, you know, I I wake up in the middle of the night and I'll say, Wow, what a dream! You know, what a dream! But I can never remember coming up with an idea in my entire lifetime, and that's 75 years where immediately said, I think this is a big one. And, uh, it, uh, but the idea, it's a, you know, it's an idea that will become a quarterly book. It's an idea that will actually become a concept in strategic coach. And, uh, and the, and it came to me in the dream. And what was really interesting, I remember the setting in the dream where I was surrounded by people saying, Oh, that is a really, really great idea. So the people in the dream were already applauding me for the for the idea. Wow. Okay, so I've never had that happen before. I've never, you know, I mean, this is a 
new experience, but I'll just simply, it's three words, and uh, and it fits in directly with um, your habit regarding procrastination. That's why I wanted to talk to you about it. And this happened last night, so this is really okay. fresh. And the title, uh, let's say it's a book, the title yeah. is Tomorrow's Tomorrow's Business Today. Ah, I like that. Tomorrow's Business Today. Yeah. And the subtitle of the book is Keeping Yourself a Day Ahead of Everything Else. That's, oh, that's so funny because, you know, this, uh, that resonates with exactly what, um, you know, I've been saying how my number one thing of uh, I know I'm being successful when is that I wake up every day and say, what would I like to do today? And the shift that I've been making is realizing that uh, it's far more powerful for me to say, I wake up every day and say, what would I like to do tomorrow? But that's really where the thing is, is that I like to, the things that I have the most, um, to get the most joy and have the most um, sort of impact are the things that I've already settled for the yeah. day. Like I realize when I wake up, when I woke up today, I already knew that what I get to do today is a uh, is a Joy of Procrastination podcast with Dan. That's mm-hmm. already settled. I get that. It doesn't require any decision or um, analysis, and it's just doing. Um, but I want to hear your your take on it. Because well, I've here here's the thing, uh, and I remember I and I remember you telling me one or two podcasts ago about this. I mean, I'm just yeah. remembering now. Uh, but I got up and I, you know, uh, you know, within a half hour after getting up, I had come down and I've already created the eight mindsets for the um, for the idea that shows you how motivated I was. Uh-huh. And uh, and here's the thing, um, and this goes back to the whole concept of everything being psychological. My my sense is that our entire psychology as people is really a function of how we're handling time. In other words, we're we're feeling very psychologically confident if it looks like we're handling time really well, and we're feeling psychologically depressed if we feel that we're you know time's getting ahead of us. And that's yeah. just a thesis. I, I don't know how you feel about that, but I I think that's guess, true. There's something about feeling um, chased about something. Yeah, I, I actually had a concept of time debt that you yeah. feel like and that we a, are in terrible. time debt, right? Yes, and I believe that the world more and more today in 2019 has a sense of time debt, um, yeah. time debt, and that it. Um, and it um and so things are really bad even though things are really good so it really tells you that people have never been safer things have never been more secure there's never been more abundance for people like you and me you know we live in we you know we you live in orlando you live in toronto um you know you travel to chicago you travel to new york london amsterdam well it's hard to it's hard to prove just on the base of physical evidence, so that anything is bad about those cities. Right. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You know, gee, the suffering in the streets of London. I said that gee, I, I, I haven't I haven't really witnessed that. I'm I'm not getting that feeling about Toronto. You know, it's really depressing in Toronto, you know, but it's, it's like everything's falling apart. The place is, you know, Thing is, the place is stagnant. And I said, gee, gee, the last thing I saw, I, I heard there were over 200 construction cranes in the city. So mm, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a sense of conflict about what you're telling me because my eyes are telling me that uh, I'm not seeing the different. stagnation. But it's an, but it kind of tells you that things are good or bad, not by the physical evidence. It's by the psychological experience that that tells you whether things are good or bad i think you're right i'm so looking one of, so here's the thing i'm going to connect my idea to your previous idea 
And I'm going to say that, and it's kind of a little bit the way you set it up, at least this is my first thought, is they set it up a little bit like the R factor question. And I'll say to you, Dean, um, it's, it's tomorrow right now. So I want you to think that it's now tomorrow and it's 24 hours ahead of where we actually are. And there are three things that you're doing tomorrow and you have done that put you as a great advantage over everybody who's just operating today. Yes. I like the start of this. So whatever is happening in the world, I'm taking as a given that the best people are doing is that they're just up to date today. But in our new system called Tomorrow's Business Today, we're actually 24 hours ahead of everybody and everything in the world. Yes. Imagine like that. Um, there was an interesting um, movie. Um, oh, I wish I could remember what it was called, but essentially it was this, it was a British um, um, guy in the movie and he uh, had this thing of time travel. Basically he could go, he could relive a day and he got into this habit of living each day twice. Mm -hmm. He would live, he would live the day once just to experience it. One, once once for one and once for rehearsal and once for performance. Exactly. Yes. Do you see the movie? Do you remember the one I'm talking about? No, or? I don't. But uh I certainly get the thought. Maybe somebody maybe somebody will um will recognize that uh, that plot, but I I yeah, thought to send man, it man, that us. is really that is really a powerful movie because I would love to watch it again yeah so the thing is that psychologically within this framework you always feel like you're in an advantage and it's not just keeping yourself a day a day ahead of everyone else it's that you're ahead of everything else it's not it's yes. not just everyone everyone else it's everything else you're always 24 you always have a 24-hour advantage and then I just, I haven't sorted out the mindsets, but I'll just go through them quickly. And the thing is, all it requires is one day where you do things double. In other words, you do what you're going to do today, but you also do what you are going to do tomorrow. So that's the hard part. There's this hard part up front where you have to do a, a double day. Okay. But remember, you only have to do this once. And what you feel as a result of getting a day ahead is the opposite of pressure. So you don't feel pressure anymore because pressure is simply the psychological sense that you're at best, you're just up with everyone else. You're not, you're not ahead of anyone else. As hard as you try, you're just up with everyone else. And it just takes a lot of effort to always be up with everyone else. And God forbid if you drop behind. Mm -hmm. I like that. and so and so the incentive would be, be get ahead right away I mean since you know the advantage is available it's like me phoning Black Lane as soon as we're finished here well why would mm -hmm. I wait till tomorrow why don't we just get Black Lane aboard right away because the moment we do then it's for a lifetime the other thing is keep it secret uh, don't tell anybody about this I like this. No, I'm telling you. I'm telling okay. you. I mean, I, you you would never forgive me if I had this thought for a couple of weeks and I hadn't told you. So um, <laughs> that's funny. No, no, but keep it secret. In other words, don't make a big deal about this because uh, who knows whether it's meaningful to anyone else anyway. So why go through the bother? And it's your advantage, so keep it a secret. And the other mm -hmm. thing is 24 hours is just enough. It doesn't have to be a week. It doesn't have to be a quarter. It just has to be 24 hours. You know? Well, that's the only this, – this couples in with my, like, meditations and reflections lately have been on the reality that the, we can only do today. And that's yeah. really, you know, I mean, I've really gotten, I've been thinking about this from a, um, 
a lead generation, lead conversion standpoint, initially that that's kind of where that thought came from. The only two time frames are now and not now. <clears throat> and <clears throat> that somebody is either ready now to to do whatever it is your your business does yeah. or they're not. And it doesn't matter if it's going to be like today, whether it's 30 days from now, 30 weeks from now, or 30 months from now, doesn't make any difference in the context of when we can actually do something about it. They're either yeah. ready to do something now or they're, or they're not. Yeah. Well, the other mm -hmm. thing is, remember, we're recording this right now, but it's just you and me. Yeah. It's going to be a couple yeah. of days before anyone else hears this. So, yes. uh, you know, uh, we're automatically, I mean, they can just never catch up. Yes. No, I, I mean, if they hear this, if they hear this on Tuesday, well, yeah. you know, but here's the thing. They'll be ahead of everyone else in their life. Yes. And I, I think, I mean, we have to be, we have, we have to be granted some privileges here, Dean, you and mm -hmm. me, we have to be granted some, there, there has to be some unusually unique payoffs for the originators. Yes. My, uh, you know, this was, it's all coming together now, Dan, as we're talking about it, that the, um, you know, this preference, of course, of I wake up every day and say, what would I like to do today is this ultimate freedom of mm -hmm. the, you know, but it also is like ultimate options and requires the ultimate like discernment on the day to your approach has been sort of the disciplined, um, you know, routine of asking yourself the night Yesterday. before, you know, what are the, the three things yeah. I'm going to do today? So you wake up and you know what those three things are. Whereas yeah. I have been waking up and saying, what would I like to do today? And then I've got, I have to not only decide, but do. So you've taken the deciding, maybe this is something here, Dan, that maybe part of it, this is what I've been thinking is that all the deciding is for the benefit of tomorrow, not today. Yeah. That, yeah. That's that the deciding, I decide what I'm going to do tomorrow. And then when tomorrow comes, so today I'm just doing, and I've been breaking it down into you know, three D's, dreaming, yeah. deciding, yeah. doing. And yeah. three D's. When, three D's, yeah. Yeah, dreaming meaning what do I want? And yeah. that was but one of maybe, the... Yeah. Maybe this relates back to the British, uh, the British character that you were talking about in the movie, that um, uh, I know if I have a comparison between how I can live tomorrow uh, compared with how I, I'm going to live the day that I'm in, I know for a fact that I can live tomorrow uh, better than I can live today. Mm -hmm. So That's what true. I'm doing is I... I'm just giving myself that advantage right now. I'm 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 going to live tomorrow, right now, and mm -hmm. that just gives me a natural advantage because, uh, um, whereas it might be possible for me to entertain screwing up today, I'm definitely not going to screw up tomorrow. Right. This is you know I I love the um, I was just looking up the definition of of dream. Because I was thinking of saying it in the term of the ability of our mind to imagine a future, right? Yeah. And this was the verb definition of dream is to indulge in daydreams or fantasies about something greatly desired. Yes. That's well, we're, and that's knowing what you. Um, I did years ago, Dan, a thing where this time debt came from. I did a, a mini book called uh, Nine Reasons Time Management Almost Never Works 
and what to do about it. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like Ben and, Hardy's book, Willpower Never Works. You know, and I right. think for the same reason, I think for the same reason. Yeah. And so this, the time management thing was my number one thing. Was yeah, but this is the uh, reason. This is yeah. As I say, the number one reason that it doesn't work is um, we don't know what we want. Well, the <laughs> other thing really is the uh, thing that. Uh, yeah, yeah. The the other thing is, uh, I have a feeling time doesn't like being managed. Right. I think. I agree. I think. Uh, I think time gets angry. Yes. If you try to manage it. Yes. Yeah. You can participate with it. You can enjoy it. You can ride it. But if you try to manage time. I think it's, mm-hmm. it. Uh, I think it kind of gets sore. Anyway, I've got two more thoughts, and then I'll uh, okay. Uh, I'll wrap it up. The other thing is, my feeling is, without, I mean, this is the first day that I'm really trying this, but I all, already get the sense that time slows down. Time yeah. slows down, and that it's delightful that you get this feeling of del- a delightful slowing down of time. Yes. Um, and it's a real pleasure that this is really a psychological pressure. And the other thing is that if you and I start operating this way, uh, nobody will notice. Right. That's true. And the, re- and the reason is that the activity of just keeping up with today doesn't allow them any surplus attention for noticing that um, somebody's doing something different. Yes. But we'll notice it. But we'll notice it, and we'll notice someone else who's on to it. In other words, it's yeah. one of those things, you know, you know, zombies. Well, that's know. one that, you know, uh, Ned, <laughs> Ned Hollowell and I had some conversations about the, um, you know, what he called them is setting up uh, bobsled runs for my days where the, yeah. the, you know, where there are bumpers on the side, there's a track that I'm, I'm running on and you just slide right through it where you get on at the top and you come out at the bottom. And what we're just, we're, we're talking about is where is this track going to run? You know, that's really mm-hmm. the thing. Otherwise my days tend to be, the way he described them, like a toddler at a picnic, <laughs> just roaming around going, oh, look at this. And oh, look at this. Where there's no real sense of. Uh, yeah, well, I think I, yeah, I think I think that describes. I mean, it, it certainly describes more of my life than the way I would describe the other part of my life. In, in yeah. other words, that the, there's more of this wandering around. Now here, here's the thing about this. Um, uh, I think this is a um, an advanced degree in the joy of procrastination. I think because uh-huh. we we've hit on this independently of each other. You know, yeah. I mean, we've we both came to this after um, three years of three years of joy of procrastination. So my feeling is it's kind of like the light bulb being invented simultaneously in about seven mm-hmm. different spots in the middle yeah. of the 18, 1800s is that yeah. um, there's a readiness of where you and where I are right now in, um, in our uh, making time a friend that yes. it was necessary for us now to move on to this level. I don't, I don't know if that explains what I'm saying here, but the, yeah, no, uh, I time friendly. It. I have, I have a time friendliness. I said, if you're, uh, if you have a time anxiety, you, you don't need hell after this lifetime you're in it. You know, uh-huh. if, if time, if time is a source of anxiety, uh, you're in hell, you're in yes. hell, you know, the, and, but, what I sense is there's a tremendous time friendliness, um, time friendliness about this notion. Yes. This is this is great. I love where this uh, conversation mm-hmm. is going. Well, I'll I send think- you uh, what I've done already. I'll just send you the uh, PDF of the mindset scorecard because I've laid out the okay. mindset. 
and then I have the, you know, the columns are open. The, you know, the column for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. But my feeling is that uh, we're not coming to this as um, innocence here. I mean, I think you no. and I have spent decades of actually dealing with this issue. This is just kind of where things have arrived at this point. So I'll send it off yeah. to you. Also, uh, um, if I was, uh, I, I, I uh, if it, if, if it was today, I probably wouldn't get to it, Dean. But since it's tomorrow, I definitely will get it. Get to it. I will Great. definitely I get, it. get it to you right, right away. Doing it today seemed like a bit of a burden, but doing it tomorrow really, really seems. So, of course, I'll send it off tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'll send it off tomorrow and I would love well, to receive it I, tomorrow I, I, I will send it off as, uh, <laughs> as soon as I am okay last we got a couple minutes Leonardo da Vinci well uh, let's say this I watched a little documentary mini documentary about Leonardo da Vinci just after you suggested that you found some research that he was well, brain brain researchers. Mm-hmm. Well, brain researchers are suspecting that maybe Leonardo da Vinci was ADHD or ADHD. Well, that was what uh, the, one of the first things in the documentary was that he was largely reputed to be a um, flighty procrastinator. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> often taking years I, to complete works. Yeah, I said I. I am, you know, I, I, I am shocked. I, I say repeat, I am shocked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, actually, there's, a, I think that there's a scene in, the, um, there was a movie about Michelangelo with Charlton Heston as Michelangelo. Uh-huh. And, uh, and there's, I think there's, you know, a fictional encounter because they lived up, they, their lives, you know, overlapped. And their and their customers overlap, you know, their patrons over overlapped, mm-hmm. and and the anyway, uh-huh. and uh, and um, um, the Charlton Heston character who plays Michelangelo uh, says dismissively to Leonardo, why, "Why don't you stick with something? Why don't you actually finish something?" <laughs> ah. <laughs> and I said, "Well, he knew." I said, well, "I mean." Michelangelo. I mean, first of all, I mean the the Sistine Chapel. He didn't start anything else while he was doing it. It was yours. I mean, um, you know, the complete completion. So he wasn't AD, ADHD. No, I saw. I just saw this thing that, um, yeah, uh, Michelangelo. The the um, David he worked on for three years nonstop. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. No, and I've seen it. I've been in. Uh, I've been in yeah. Florence, you know, and uh, it's spectacular. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, and he's got this great line again. It might be apocryphal, and they said, "Well, how, how do you, how do you draw such? How do you sculpt such perfect statues?" And he said, "Well, the statue is already sculpted. I just chip away all the rock that doesn't belong to the statue." Right, exactly. I just chip away everything that's not David. Right. Yeah, yeah and I try. I, I tried that one day on something, and it didn't work. Uh oh. Uh oh. I must have. I must have picked a little piece of rock that didn't have a statue in it. That that's the only thing I can explain. Yeah. Well, Dan, this I I'm, I'm so excited. I think we have uh, another breakthrough. I mean, we've. We should, I think it'd be interesting for us to recap uh, in an episode here our the breakthroughs that we've had as a result yes. of these conversations because now yeah. we're really uh, we're really getting yeah. somewhere. We need a yeah, joint but this, this one this book. this one feels like it's going to be uh, tremendously consequential consequential for each of us, and if it didn't go any farther than that, um, it's worth everything. That's exactly the way I feel about everything about the joy of procrastination. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it. if others if others get a lot out of it, that's a bonus. 
but um, yes. um, this feels right, and uh, I'm even more fortified in my belief after the hour. And you could see why today it had to be at 11 o'clock and not 12.30. Yes, I do. I like it. And for future okay. uh, times. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Again. Well, um, um, tomorrow we're going to call Black Lane, and that's going to happen immediately after the phone call. And tomorrow I'm going to send on the PDF of the sheet, and um, that'll happen immediately after the phone call. I love it. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Talk next week. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye.